Okay, so let's begin. We're going to continue with our uh, read Miller codes. So let me remind you once again how we are uh, thinking about these codes. So we have uh, the first. So if you want to think of read Miller code, after the read Miller code, the length two par m. Uh, you're going to think of uh, binary variables. How many of them do you have? V1, V2, Vm. And then this will be a polynomial of uh, what's called total degree. I simply say degree by degree, I mean total degree, what's the way to go up. Okay? And then what do you do? You go from here to a code word. And what is uh, the thing about this code word? It basically has an evaluation of x on zero uh, one m. Right? That's right. So you go through every single vector in zero one m, evaluate this polynomial f on those vectors. You will get how many points? So there are how many guys here? There are two par m vectors. So if you evaluate it and make a vector, you will have. We have to parent them. So this will be f of zero or zero, or the work of the one. Okay. So this was one view of the code word. Another thing to say is that this is actually a, a Boolean function. Okay. So there, uh, let's uh, one more view. Then you can also think of uh, generator matrix uh, ideas and all that. So all these things we saw. And then we've been seeing a bunch of properties. Uh, one powerful property is the U e plus V construction. So if you want the read Miller code after a read Miller code oh, of length 2 par m, you can do a u u plus v construction. You will come from the r the read Miller code of length 2 par m minus 1 and we will come from the r minus 1 third read Miller code of length 2 par m minus 1. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. So you will come from belongs to r m r m minus 1, we will belong to r m. Minus one comma minus one. So from here you can build up the generator matrix in a nice way if you like. That's, uh, that's one view of uh, this. Okay, so from this property, uh, we we showed that the demon equals two part m minus r. Okay. So that's another uh, another property which is which is quite uh, nice to show. Okay. The the thing we're going to show today is. Uh, few more interesting properties and once again we will we'll play with this uh, this notion of the polynomial evaluation and the vector interpretation. Okay, so both of them will go hand in hand. So you think of a polynomial and then the vector that, it, that results when you evaluate it on every single possible uh, value of for the variables. You will get a vector and then you play with that vector. So it's, it's, it's this relationship is what gives all the nice properties for real Miller code. So it's where, it's where everything comes from. So we will continue with that. And the property that we'll see today is about the dual, the dual of r comma m. So you can show that if you take the r power of equal to m, the dual will be another read mole of r. So order m minus r minus one. Okay, so this is the result. Uh, okay, so the first thing worth checking is that the number of vectors that you expect in the dual is the same as on the right hand side. Okay, so here the dimension is what? What's the dimension of the dual of r of r comma m? It's 2 par m minus k r m. What is k r m? 1 plus m choose 1 plus 1 choose 2 plus 1 plus choose R. Okay, so that's the dimension. What is the dimension here? One plus M choose one plus M choose two all the way to M choose M minus R minus one. Are these two the same? Well it has to be the same, I gave you the result, but I will you show that these two are the same? 
So you can do that. If you see 2 power m will be actually 1 plus m choose 1 plus m choose 2 all the way to m choose m. You write it that way, you subtract it out, all the first things go away and then you use the identity that m choose k is the same as m choose n minus k, you will get this answer. Okay, so it is not very hard to do that. It is uh, straightforward computation. Okay, so you see at least as far as dimension is concerned, these two match. So if I show that the RHS is contained in the LHS, I will be, I'll be done. Okay, so dimension is the same, both of them have the same number of elements. So if I show that the right hand side, that is the code words of the M minus R minus one third are read Miller code, right? The code words of those is contained in the dual of the R and uh, read Miller code on the left hand side. Okay, what do you mean by saying a code word here is contained in the dual? It should be orthogonal to every single code word of the original code. Okay, so a code word of R M M minus R minus one should be orthogonal to every single code word of R M R comma M. Once I show that, I am done. Okay, so that's what we will show. So we will show for we will show the following for let's say some A which belongs to R M minus M minus R minus one comma M. Okay, so let's say the code word and a B which belongs to R M of R comma M that will be have we have what a dot b equal to what zero. Okay, so this is what I want to show. Okay. So now there are various ways of uh, doing this. So of course we are going to use the polynomial idea. Remember the vector a is associated with the polynomial of degree one m minus r minus 1. The vector b is associated with the polynomial of degree r. Okay. So, at most r, okay, remember that, at most r minus r minus 1, at most r. Okay. So, what will happen if I multiply these two polynomials? Okay. I will multiply, let us say, I multiply, I can multiply these two polynomials. Now, what will the evaluation of that product polynomial correspond to? How will it be related to A and B? You see that? Okay, so the question I am asking is A will be A0, A1 all the way to A uh, 2 bar m minus 1. Okay, each AI is what? Right, some polynomial f of B1 to M evaluated at let us say I. So, what do you think of? How do you think of I? So, what is I? I is just an integer from 0 to 2 power m minus 1. Okay. So, I can now take it m bit representation. Okay. So, every integer from 0 to 2 power m minus 1 has an m bit representation. I will take its m bit representation, take the first bit and use it for v1. Second bit, I will use it for v2. Okay. So, instead of thinking of my substituting variables as bits, m bits, I can think of it as an integer from 0 to 2 power m minus 1. So nothing wrong with it. Okay. Is that clear? So, i is an integer from 0 to 2 power m minus 1. It has an m bit representation. How many bits are there in an m bit representation? m bits. Okay. First bit, second bit, third bit, all the way to nth bit. I will simply use v1 equal to the first bit, v2 equal to the second bit, v3 equal to the third form. Okay. So, that is what I mean by this substitution. Okay. So, this i I can think of as a value that is taken by v1 through vn. Is it clear? Is it clear or should I to give out a very clear explanation for this? Is it clear? Okay. So, I can think of, so suppose suppose m is 4, okay. I can think of the 4 bit, 20, 4 bit vectors as going all the way from like this or equivalently what can I think of it as? 0, 1, 2, all the way to 15. Okay. So, if I say I substitute let us say some 9, what does it mean? I will actually be substituting 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay, so, both of them are equal. I can think of it this way. Okay. This is my vector A. Likewise, so what do you know about F? Degree of F is less than or equal to M minus R minus 1. Likewise, I will have B, which is B0, B1, and the way to B to power M minus 1. And what is BI? Some G evaluated at, evaluated at the same I. Right, that's how it goes. Okay, so so what do you know about degree of g? 
degree of g is less than or equal to r okay now what happens when i multiply s and g okay i'll get some other polynomial and its degree will be less than or equal to m minus 1 okay now if i evaluate that product at i what will i get will i get ai times bi so no so what happens if i evaluate f of b1 to be m times g of b1 b2 b m at i what will i get a i times b i is it okay right so this new vector let's say let's call it some v that i'm going to define okay and i'll define a new vector v which is b0 b1 b2 power m plus 1 and this vi will basically be the product evaluated at i okay and you know this vi equals ai bi so what is a dot b summation vi mod 2 okay so if i search the show that weight of b is going to be even all the time then i'm done am i right okay all i have to show is weight of b is even okay so this would be zero is weight of b is even okay how do i know that weight of b will be even what is the degree of this guy less than or equal to m minus 1 so what will happen if i take a polynomial of degree less than or equal to m minus 1 and evaluate it at all the possibilities will i get a even weight vector i will get a even weight vector. so clearly it is okay so that implies v belongs to the regional accord of m minus 1 m and that clearly implies weight of v is even and m okay so it's a very simple proof except that you go back and forth between this vector and polynomial and it can be very confused okay the first time you see it it will never really be clear but if you think about it it's, it's a very kind of an obvious easy proof Okay, is it okay? It's on too slick for that. <laughs> All right. So you take a vector from the first chord. You see that it's an evaluation of a polynomial at all points. Take a vector from another chord. It's also an evaluation of a polynomial at every point. Now, if I take the two corresponding coordinates A and B and multiply together, it's the same as evaluating the product polynomial at the same position. Okay. But interestingly, the product polynomial has degree less than or equal to m minus one, which means It belongs to the regional vector m minus one comma m, and that you know is an even weight chord. I mean, as in every vector in that uh, chord is even weight, and that shows you that there is two after them. Okay, so this will work for even m minus r minus two. Okay, so if this degree is less than or equal to m minus r minus two, also the same logic will work. So why can I not conclude that regional vector of m minus r minus two is the dual? The dimension will not agree. Dimension will be smaller. Okay, there are more chords in the dual. Okay. But when you go to m minus r minus one, interestingly, the dimension matches. Okay, so it means that this is the dual. There's nothing more. Okay, so you can stop there. That doesn't. That also makes sense, right? See, m minus r minus two is clearly contained in m minus r minus one. So that this is the dual. This will also be the dual. It's not. It's not a very surprising fact. I mean, all these words are nicely contained in each other. So that's two of them. Okay. So so this makes a very interesting family. So if you think about cyclic codes, right? So we had first of all, I mean, of course, there are. Very easy statements to make. So, if you look at linear codes, the dual of a linear code is also a linear code. So, this is a nice closed structure it has. Likewise, for cyclic codes, interestingly, the dual is also cyclic. And for Riemann codes, again, what do you get? The dual is Riemann code. Okay. So, all these things are nice. I mean, for BCH codes, also you can show dual is BCH. Riemann codes also you show dual is uh, Riemann expression. All those things you can show. So, it's nice. Uh, how do you say it? It's nice closed property with respect to the dual. And that uh, maybe you can see it's about it. Okay, so even if you don't have any immediate use for it, we'll see that there is a use for it. Okay, so we use this soon enough. But it's good to know that the dual also has some good properties. Okay, in the decoding we can use it. All right. Any questions on how I did this? Okay, so the first time you see it, this proof can be confusing, but it's a view. That's how all proofs in the Riemann codes go. You always use the property of the code and its and the polynomial evaluation, and then go back and forth and solve the question. Okay. 
Is that all right? So let's let's take a simple example for let's say n equals uh, three and look at what happens. Okay, so it's nice to see the n equal to three example. So n equal to three is uh, let's write down the vectors. So one is going to be one 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 one. B three is going to be zero 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 one 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 one. B two is going to be zero zero one one zero zero one one. B one is going to be zero one zero one zero one zero one. Then I have to worry about V three V two, which will be zero 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 one. V three V one, which will be zero 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 one. And then I have to worry about V one V two, which will be zero 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 one zero 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 one. Then finally. V1, V2, V3, which should be zero, 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 zero. Okay. So, so now let's generate a matrix for Reid Muller code. Well, the zero order is really not that interesting, but anyway, let's do it. Zero comma three would be what? Only the first row. Okay. So you get the repetition. Is that correct? You get the repetition code. Okay. So this is the eight n equals eight repetition code. Okay, and then you have the first order read Miller third, which will be an eight four four four. Right? What will be the generator matrix? The first four rows. Okay, and then if I want the second order read Miller third, it's going to be. Eight seven two four. Okay, so this will be the even weight code. Okay, so let me not talk about the R M three comma three, which is identity code. It's not really that useful. So okay, so you can use our result now and see that for the zero comma three, what is what should be it doing? M minus R minus one. Okay, so you put R equal to zero, M is three, you get two comma three. So what happens if I put R equal to one? You get the same thing again. So this guy is in fact a self-dual code. Okay, the code is its own dual. Okay, so it's an interesting little matrix there. So let's look at the generator matrix for that guy. This is the generator matrix, right? Okay, so it has a very nice symmetric-looking structure. And it's also self-dual. So, uh, so one property of self-dual codes is k will be equal to n by two. The correct code is also equal k equals n minus k, right? So k should be equal to n by two. Okay, so that is satisfied there. And another way to check the self-dual property is any two rows of the generator matrix will be orthogonal to each other, and that's kind of enough to show self-dual. Okay, so you look at any two rows of the generator matrix, they will all be orthogonal to each other. Okay, because g is equal to h in a way. So g and h are the same. You know, g times h transpose has to be zero, so g times g transpose has to be zero. Okay, so both the both conditions you check. You can see it's self dual. You can do that very easily. Okay, and you can do if n equals four, you'll get a more. Uh, I mean, this the list of uh, bi binary vectors is sixteen. It's a bit more painful to write it down. If you want, you can write it down. To do that, you'll, you'll get a different list. So what I'm going to do is just write down uh, if n equals four, four of them two. So now once again, I'm of Adam zero comma. And three comma four be duals of each other. So this will be the repetition code, and this will be the even weight code. And then what else will you have? R M of one comma four, and here we have two comma four. Okay, so these two will be duals of each other. So what's the dimension here? Sixteen comma five. And eight, right? Eight is the minimum distance. What's the dimension here? Has to be eleven. The minimum distance is four. Is that right? Okay. So there's another useful and simple rule you can keep in mind if you're worried about how do I select the vectors. So if we have sixteen vectors, right? What are the sixteen uh, basis vectors? One, B one, B 
D3, D4. So on the way to the last stage, even we do it D4. Okay. If I want the basis vectors for Rm2, comma 4, another rule to keep in mind. Okay. So I may, I may not have thought it like that, but it's very easy also to think about it. You look at these 16 basis vectors. You select all the vectors whose weight is greater than or equal to 4. Okay. In this list, you select all the vectors whose weight is greater than or equal to 4. They will be the top level. Okay. It's not very difficult to think about it. Yes, you can see that once it goes to V1, V2, V3, your weight will go down by go down to 2. Only if you have two of them, the weight will be greater than equal to 4. So that's a useful rule to keep in mind. Among these 16 vectors, all the vectors whose weight is greater than equal to 4 make a generator matrix for the 16 R 16 11 4 4. The minimum distance plays a nice role that way. Okay. So in this construction, it's not very useful because anyway you can go from the top and pick it up. But in the other Kronecker product construction I gave you, I said there is a permutation of this which shows up. There you may not know where which is coming. Okay. There you can use this rule very nicely. If I want the R part of the code, what will I do? I look at all the rows of that matrix whose weight is greater than or equal to 2 power m minus r and that will give me my uh, generator matrix. Okay. okay. So that is that is a rule that is useful to remember. Okay. So just just like a side information. So these two are duals. Okay, so let us just do an equal 5 just for fun. Okay. We have once again Rm of 0, 4, 0, 5, Rm of 4, 5, we have Rm of 2, 5, Rm of 3, 5, and then you have Rm of 2, 5, and what will happen to 2, 5? It will be self dual. So you can show every time m is odd. Rm of m minus 1 by 2 comma m will be a self dual code. Okay, and you can do quickly dimensions if you like. So for this case, maybe dimension is interesting. 32 comma 6 or the 16 code. Okay, so what is this one? 32 comma 26. What? 4, right? Okay, this case is what? 32 comma should be 16, right? You can do the addition, but it should be 16. And then you have 8. Okay. So it's a nice, it's a nice order to these numbers. What is the nice order to these numbers? 2 power 5, comma 2 power 4, comma 2 power 3. Okay. So, so that's a nice uh, thing to keep in mind. So in fact, that will be generally true. So what will happen to Rm of uh, m minus 1 by 2, comma m? What will be its uh, coordinates? 2 power m, power m equals 2 power m, comma 2 power m minus 1. Why should it be 2 power m minus 1? Well, I know it's self dual, so it has to be equal to that. And then what will be the thing? Sorry? 2 power m minus m plus 1 by 2, right? Okay. So this will be the parameter. So, so in this nice case, it turns out that m plus 1 by 2 is the same as m minus 2. Okay, so it may not happen in general. So, Yes, of course, m has to be odd. Okay. We're okay. m minus m minus 1 by 2, that will be m plus 1 by 2. So, this will be a self dual curve. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say about duals, and this structure is uh, quite useful. And uh, what else? So, let's move on to encoding. So, we're going to talk about encoding. So, here we'll use one more interesting property. So the first encoder you can do is to use the generator matrix. Okay. So what are likely to be problems if I use the generator matrix? Okay. So you might say it could be a huge matrix. You have to store something, but you have the recursive structure, right? So maybe you don't store too much. I mean, maybe you can get away with some savings there. But there's one more problem which you cannot do away with if you use the generator matrix again. What is that problem? It's not systematic. Okay, so it ends up being not systematic, and maybe you don't like it too. Okay. Okay. So, so it turns out we can use one more structure for the Reed Muller codes. It turns out Reed Muller codes are very, very closely related to cyclic codes. Okay. So, in fact, you can puncture one bit of the Reed Muller code and get a cyclic code. Okay. So that is the that is the fact. Okay. So basically, another another idea is to use the puncturing. Okay. So you puncture. 
comes for one day of a regional approach to get a cyclic code. Okay, so how do you do this? I tell you how to do this. We won't prove this very rigorously. I will like, uh, prove this uh, too painful and unnecessary. So we'll, I'll, I'll show you how it's done and you'll see it's kind of obvious it has to work out that way. But the, the puncture, uh, this is a very interesting idea. So, so how do you use this idea? Well, suppose I tell you that this is true. Suppose I tell you there is a port which you can, there is a bit which you can puncture in the read molecule. cord. Okay, once you puncture it, you get a cyclic code. So then what you can, what can you do? You encode the cyclic code, even systematically. And then how do you then generate the puncture code again? You add an overall parity. Okay, so puncturing is some parity of the original thing, so you can do that. So this can be used very nicely to build an encoder. Okay, so this property can be used to build a systematic encoder. idea. So which one should be puncture? That's the first uh, question. So I'll tell you the answer and then uh, we'll, we'll do this first by example. Okay, So we'll do a very simple example first and then we'll go through and see why it should be true in general. Okay, So the example I'm going to take is, uh, so we'll begin with the simplest example. We'll take R1, uh, 1, 1, 3. Okay, We'll take the first order read molecule of length 8. So how do we generate the matrix? Should I do this? Should I do this? No. I take the dual of this code. Okay. So, so what's the dual of this code? So oh, RM13 is its own dual. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. So that's nice. So let's take the dual. So the parity check matrix, which is also the generator matrix, is what? You have 1111 one, one, one on top. I'm going to write the 1111 one, one, one at the bottom because that's what we're maybe used to. Okay. I'm going to write the remaining stuff. Okay. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, This part is just the 7, 4, 3, 4 things. Right? So, what is the additional operation that has been done? Well, we saw this before. Yeah, we are adding, extending the code. We are extending to add an overall parity check matrix. So extension and puncturing are opposites of each other. Right? You see, if you take the extended version and puncture the last bit, what will you get? You should get. No, I should be careful there. Extension and shortening are opposites of each other. If I extend and puncture, what will happen? If I puncture this, what will happen? Okay. Oh no. What happens when I puncture? It should uh, be confused. So, so, puncturing is easier in the generator matrix. Right? So, in the parity check matrix, puncturing is a bit more painful. So, what should we do when you puncture? Yeah, you are right. I mean, it, it will go away. This will also go away and that will also go away. Right? So, we will get back to the 743 Hamming code. What do I know about the 743 Hamming code? It is a cyclic code, right? Not in this order. In what order is it a cyclic code? How should I order the columns to get a cyclic code in the Hamming code? Yeah, take the primitive element of GF8 and do 1 alpha, alpha square, alpha power 3 all the way to alpha power 6. Not in this order. Don't do 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 and all that. First one will be 0, 0, 1. Next will be alpha. It will be 0, 1, 0. Next will be alpha square, which will be 1, 0, 0. Next will be alpha part 3, which is 0, 1, 1, etc. So, you put it in a different order, you get a cyclic code. Okay. So, you puncture the read Miller code and then evaluate the polynomial in a different order. Okay. Right? What do you get when you do that? You get a Hamming code, which is a cyclic code. Okay. So, so, that's the idea. Okay, essentially that is the idea. So, so this, uh, so so this guy is cyclic. Uh, after all, column permutation.
Okay. So the same thing you can show is true for any arbitrary Reed Miller code. So there it's a little bit more difficult to prove that result, right? So it's not as easy as 34 four extended the code, but we can, I can easily do this without any problem. But the extension maybe is not too hard. Okay. So I have to go to the dual of a read code, which will be again a read code. It will have an extension like this. So I can function it. And then I will have uh, the evaluations okay, at non-zero vectors. I have to reorder the evaluation according to the primitive element. Okay, so I can always take a primitive element in GF2 param and reorder the evaluation. So, so far we have been just evaluating in the natural bit order. I have to now reorder it in terms of the alpha, alpha square and all this. It comes in some crazy order. Once you reorder it and evaluate it, it turns out that read Muller code is sick. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so let me write it down. Uh, I'll write down the result. I'll give you a hint as to how you prove it, but you won't really prove it. Okay, so this is the result. The main result is you take a read Muller code. So in general, you take a read Muller code of alpha man. Okay, you can show first bit. So what do I mean by first bit? You can show the evaluation corresponding to It's quite easy to do this. So what do you mean by puncture the evaluation corresponding to 0, 0, 0? Simply don't evaluate it. Okay? So you start only with the non-zero vectors for V1 through Vm. Okay? And then what do you do? You evaluate in the order 1 alpha alpha square all the way to alpha power 2 power m minus 2 and what is alpha? It's a primitive element of gf2 power m. What do I mean by evaluating a polynomial in m binary variables at alpha? What do I mean by that? At alpha power i. What do I mean by that? What does that mean? How can I evaluate f of v1, v2, vm at alpha power i. What does that mean? Previously we saw evaluating it at the integer i where i was between 0 and 2 power m minus 1. So now what do you do for alpha power i? So I take the vector representation. I know it is n bits. So you put v1 equal to the first bit in the vector representation, v2 equal to the second bit in the vector representation. Okay. Except that now in the in the previously when I did uh, binary simple binary representation, we come in the natural binary order. Now it won't come in the natural binary order. It will come in some crazy order according to the uh, primitive the sequence in the value field uh, arithmetic. Okay, so that's the only thing. So evaluate that. The only thing I skip this. I'm not evaluating it at zero. Okay, zero. I'm skipping. I'm only evaluating it one from alpha to two power minus two. So if you do that, it turns out this Reed Miller code will be the punctured Reed Miller code. Okay. So in fact, after puncturing, they usually do a star. So this is without the puncturing. So Rm of R comma M star is the punctured version after the first person puncture. And then evaluated in this sequence, you get a cyclic one. Okay, so this becomes cyclic. Okay. So all right, you have a question? Is it okay? That's the idea. I mean I'm not is it okay? It's just a notation. If see Rm of R comma M is without the puncturing. If I put a star, it means that I am puncturing. So, punctured version is denoted as Rm of R comma M star. Okay. So for instance, the 743 Hamming code will be Rm of 1 comma 3 star. Yes. Yeah, the first bit will be dropped. Yes. Huh. Yes. So, what do you mean by which system basically? All one system is obtained by a cyclic shift of itself. Right? So, see the way of okay, think of cyclic words is you have a code word, you have a code word, you cyclically shift it, it should continue to be a code word, that's all. Don't think of obtaining the code word as a cyclic shift of something else, and that does not really need it. Okay. Not by cyclic shift of GFX. See, by a multiple of GFX. So you, you have to add also. 
Okay. Is it okay? You see, I mean, it's, it's kind of a difficult result to prove in general, so I'm not going to prove it. So, what will be the parameters of Rm of R, M star? See, you know, Rm of R, M is a 2 power M, comma K of Rm, comma 2 power M of R code. Okay, so what will be Rm of R, M star? It will be a length 2 power M minus 1. What will be the K? K will remain the same. Okay, technically this requires a proof, but you can quickly see that this will be true. Okay, so K will be uh, the same. Okay, so you will have the same number of polynomials. It's not really difficult to see that. Okay, and 2 power m minus r will become definitely 2 power m minus r minus 1. Okay, so if you go around the way, so it's not, uh, it's, you will have an odd weight vector and you can show that's also. Okay, it's not very fun. Okay, and this can be a cyclic code. Remember that. That's an advantage. This can be made a cyclic code, which means it has a generator polynomial GFX, which you can use in a systematic encoding very nicely. Okay. Okay. So, so what is nice is again we won't see this result. It turns out for GFX for this code, there is a there is a formula. Okay, what do I mean by formula? Some way to generate GFX. Okay, somebody has developed the formula. If you want, you can see our book, the uh, Linen Costler book has this formula. So you can see it. It's a bit of a complicated formula. I'm not going to do, do it at the in class. But there is a formula. Okay. So it's not very scary. So somebody will somebody will tell you how to find the GFX for a reasonable code. Okay, so you don't have to worry about it. But it's not a BCH code. Okay, in many cases it's not a BCH code. In some cases it is a BCH code, very few cases. Mostly it's not a BCH code. Okay, it will be a subcode of the BCH code. Okay, so it will be a cyclic non-BCH code. Okay. And uh, let me give you an inkling as to why this has to be true. Okay. Why will this uh, thing work out to be cyclic? Okay. Remember what, what I want to show is if I have a code word, every code word corresponds to a polynomial evaluation. Okay. Now this polynomial evaluation is basically evaluation at alpha par i. If I cyclically shift it to the left, what happens? I am evaluating this at alpha bar i plus 1 in a way, right? Right? I have to show if I do f of v1 through vm evaluated at alpha bar i plus 1, it is the same as some other g of v1 through vm evaluated at alpha bar i, right? If I show that, I am done. That is how you prove it. Okay? So, it turns out this function, instead of thinking of it as a function of binary variables, you can also, this is polynomial, instead of thinking of it as a polynomial with binary variables, you can also think of it as a polynomial with coefficients from g of 2 bar. Okay, so it turns out it is possible. It is a very complicated hierarchy polynomial. It is a bit more complicated to explain it to you. But you can think of it always as a polynomial over g of 2 bar with coefficients from g of 2 bar you put the argument alpha bar i directly into the polynomial, you will get back the bit. Okay, you will have a polynomial with a gf2 param with gf2 param coefficients, but when you plug in every alpha par i, what will you get? You will get a bit. Okay, you will never get another element of gf2 param. So, it is a crazy kind of polynomial, right? You think about it. So, there are polynomials like that. So, it is quite advanced to think about what those polynomials will be, but there are polynomials like that. So, you can think of this polynomial evaluation, not just as a polynomial in multiple variables, with binary values, you can think of it as a polynomial with a single variable, but that single variable comes from g of 2 power. Okay. Once you go to that kind of thing, multiplying by evaluating at alpha power i uh, or i plus 1 is very simple. You simply take, you take f of x and put instead of x, you put alpha x. Okay. You will get a g of x which is f of alpha x and f of x evaluated at alpha power i plus 1 will be the same as g of x evaluated at alpha power okay. so something like that. Okay, so, so it's very easy to go once you have a polynomial over GF2 power. Okay, so we won't see the proof, but that's the idea. So what I will urge you to do is, in the BCH and RS codes assignment, there is a last problem. If you go to my web page and look at BCH codes and RS codes, there is a last problem. That problem basically describes the construction of reed solomon codes by polynomial evaluation. Okay, try that for a while. Okay, so instead of going to read Miller codes, it's much more fancy multiple variables and all this, read some read solving code is much easier. You can try solving that problem, okay. There are hints for that problem, try solving that problem, you will see exactly what I mean, okay. There is a way to show read solving codes are cyclic and all that, it is nicely to come out, okay. Try that, 
and that will give you a hint as to how this proof will work. Okay, so in general, if you are interested later, come and talk to me, I can give you references and try to see your proof. Okay, so that is the idea. So essentially, the main result we have is quite useful and powerful. Okay, the punctured version. and it has a generated polynomial which you can compute somebody knows the formula for it you can compute it so it seems very nice okay so you can do encoding very easy is it okay all right so that's the read miller code encoding part and we'll uh, as far as encoding is concerned we'll simply stop there we're going to move towards decoding and uh, okay so so of course the main reason why i did encoding is to convince you that the encoders are simple even if you have very large read molar code, encoding is very, very simple. And the uh, next thing we want to talk about is decoding. Okay. So the decoding for read molar codes is really, really interesting. Okay. So it's one of the most interesting and useful decoders because it will be a decoder which you have never seen so far. It's a very implementable decoder which can correct errors beyond minimum distance. Okay. It's, if you think about it, it's a scary kind of uh, case. You never saw a decoder like that. It's a very simple decoder. If I describe it to you, you'll say it's the simplest thing in the world. It's much more simple than all the Delicam, Massey, and you know, all some error locator, error, error uh, image, and all this. No, no such confusion. It's a very simple decoder. But it turns out it can correct errors beyond minimum distance also. So it's, it's powerful also. But on the flip side, it won't have, it won't correct all the errors that it should be correcting sometimes. So if you have an error correcting capability t, less than t it might not correct. Okay. So so in many ways this is a very interesting kind of decoder. Okay. And uh, we'll see in the next course. We we'll do the next course. Many of the decoders that we'll see in the next course will be like that. Okay. They will not they will not have any guaranteed error correcting capability, but they will perform very very well because they can correct much larger number of errors most of the time. Okay. So that is the idea. So it's that's uh, it's an interesting trade off. And this is the first kind of decoder that we are seeing that that plays a role. Okay, so I'm going to first describe the concept behind the decoding, and then tell you how to implement that concept for read molar codes. Okay, so what is the concept behind decoding? This concept is called majority logic. Okay, so you decode by majority logic. So, so let's say we have a code C, which is an N K code. Okay, and I have a code word C1, C2, Cn. It is sent over some channel, right? So now it gets added to it, error vector, and you receive R. R will be R1 to R. Okay? So the first difference between this majority logic decoder and boundary distance decoders and all, we will not be attempting to find the entire code word directly or entire error vector directly. We will try to find the deep, we will try to decode bit by bit. That makes, as it turns out, very surprising that it, it makes a big difference. Okay. So whether you try to find bit by bit or whether you try to find the code word directly. Okay. So in a way, if you look at the boundary distance decoder or even the syndrome decoder, right, we are trying to find the code word directly. Right. We are trying to find the error vector directly. So here what we will do is, we will be trying to find every bit. Okay. I will be only concerned about decoding C1. Okay. In fact, what will happen is, we won't even try to make sure that all the individual bits that we decoded together will actually be a code word. We don't even have to care about that. Okay. So we will simply pay, say, I decoded these bits. Assuming it's systematic encoding, I will simply take a subset of those bits and say, that's my message. Okay. I don't even have to worry about ensuring that the entire uh, decoded code word I put out was actually a code word. Okay. So that is called bitwise decoding. Okay. So this is a bitwise decoding method. So uh, we will try to find C i cap okay, for every i. Alright? And like I said, there is no effort to ensure that C1 cap, C2 cap, so on till C n cap is actually a code word. We may not even try to do that. But we will try to find each bit of the of the code word. Okay? Estimates for each bit of the code word. Okay? So that is the first idea. Okay? So the next idea is Again, these are all powerful ideas which you will see later on in the next second course that people have used to build very powerful decoders. So majority logic is not that powerful, but the concepts here are usually useful in the in general. Okay. So first is bitwise. 
Okay. So, so what is immediately nice about bitwise is you are not worried about n. Okay. n could be very large, hundred thousand, but I am only worried about one bit at a time. Okay. So maybe it's not too scary. Okay. The next idea which is useful, useful is you use some local structure around the IP. Okay. So what do I mean by local? I'll come to it. So this local structure can be derived, defined in so many ways. Okay, this local structure is used to estimate C I hat. Okay. So these two ideas are proved to be very powerful today. Okay, so in the you know, modern interpretations of course, doing bitwise decoding and how do you do bitwise decoding? You use only the structure around CI, so to speak, local structure. Okay. So again, when you go to very, very large block lengths, local structure is much easier to deal with than the global huge structure. So things like 2 power n minus k and all, you won't even see. Okay. I'm only worried about one bit and what's around that bit. Okay. So what do you mean by what's around that bit? Let me clarify that. Okay. So my idea is, at least in majority logic decoding, this is how they interpret this local structure. You look for parity checks. Involve C. Okay, so this is the important thing, and this is used even in modern codes. You always look for parity checks that involve the ith bit. Okay, so that is local structure. Okay, what do you mean by parity check? What is a parity check? Every row of the parity check matrix is a parity check. Are those the only parity checks? No, right? Every code word in the dual is a parity check. Okay, so when I say parity check, I mean code words in the dual. Okay. So what do I, when I say code words in the dual, that parity checks that involve CI, what should this code words in the dual have? The ith position should be one. So we have this Reed Miller code, we are stuck to decoding it and how do we do it? We try to exploit local structure of Reed Miller code. Okay. In the modern interpretation what people do is people don't care about starting with the Reed Miller code. They will say I will define a code with very nice local structure. Okay. I will as it is when I define my code itself, I will define a local structure that is very nice. Then you don't have to go hunting for code words in the dual with one and the ith position because you designed it like that. So you will just see it and you will pick, pick it up. Okay. For Reed Miller code since we are doing like some kind of a legacy compatible implementation in a way. So you have the readmill code, you're stuck with it, you're not you don't have a choice of designing your own code. So you take the readmill code and then you try and find its local structure. What is the local structure that you can find? Try to find code words in the dual which have a one in the ith position. Okay. So now I want to remind you of one powerful thing about the cyclic property that we saw. Okay. Because you have the cyclic property, what is nice is at least for the punctured version, if I find local structure for the ith bit, Let's say with i equals one. I find local structure for the first bit. What have I also found? I found local structure for every single bit. Why is that? It's simply cyclically rotated because I know dual of a cyclic code is also cyclic. Okay, so if I have a parity check, if I have some code words in the dual, I simply cyclically shift it. I'll get other code words in the dual, and because I cyclically shifted it, that all the ones in the first position will become ones in the second position, third position, whatever. Okay, so that way read Miller code is nice. So you have to find local structure for a particular bit, the same structure will be obeyed according to the cyclic shift. So you be slightly careful with the cyclic shift, okay, because the cyclic order comes in with alpha, alpha, pari, okay, and you will see the local structure might be easier to find in the normal, normal bit order, okay, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, etc. okay. So when you do the cyclic shift, you will be slightly careful, but as long as you are careful with that, you will do it, okay, that is the idea. Alright, so these are powerful ideas, like I said, they have a very, very modern interpretation where the to be very useful, but we will apply it to the read Miller codes first. Okay, so we will try to find parity checks that involve CI, and I will tell you what majority logic is. Okay, so that we will do in the next class. Okay, sometime next week, in the last class for this week. Enjoy your Pashava break. I don't know if you are doing something interesting for Puja, but anyway, so have fun. We will meet on Monday.